question. Uh, can you all see, you all can see the, the slide, right? Yes. Awesome. Okay, so thank you so much, Worshipful. I, uh, I appreciate you um, asking me for, for, uh, to, to be here with you all tonight. Um, it's my honor. And I want to thank all the brothers that are in attendance. I really appreciate you taking the time um, to be here with us tonight. Um, hopefully, we can have a very engaging discussion after this presentation. This is something that has become very important in my life. I, st I first gave this presentation back in February at my lodge. And since then, I've had the uh, pleasure to be able to give it again uh, for other lodges and other brothers. And every time that I present it, I'm always constantly adding new information um, that, I'm, that I'm researching. Uh, so I hope to be able to give yet another updated version at another time. Um, but I'm very happy to be able to talk about two things that are very important in my life, and that's Stoicism and Stoic philosophy and Freemasonry. Now, I want to share some information with you that I found, um, and this was in April when uh, I think that right when we had gone into lockdown in the state of Florida, there was an article released on April 16, 2020 called Dress Rehearsal for Catastrophe, How Stoics Are Speaking to Lockdown Readers. And it was by a journalist called Alison Flood. It was a Guardian article. And in the article, she explains that according to Penguin Random House, the publisher, um, their print sales of meditations are up 28% for the first quarter of 2020 versus 2019 while print sales of letters from a Stoic are up 42% for the same period. And in the last four weeks since that article was published, the eBooks have actually risen by 356%. Now the Meditations is a philosophical text written by Marcus Aurelius. Um, it's pretty much the foundation for what I'm going to be speaking about tonight in relation to Freemasonry and letters from a Stoic is written by a Stoic philosopher called Seneca. So if you're interested in reading either of those two, I highly suggest that you do. Um, and then in the article, she goes on to explain that in the last eight years, there's been an increase with the publisher saying that around 16,000 copies of the meditations were sold in 2012. And this increased to more than 100,000 copies in 2019. So we're seeing that during this time that we've been on lockdown, Stoicism and Stoic philosophy has been on the rise because people have been looking for uh, these Stoic texts that have greatly helped a lot of people during difficult moments in their lives. And at the same time, I would argue that Freemasonry has also been on the rise because since we've been on lockdown, we've seen that a lot of uh, presentations have been offered on a daily basis. So we've been able to share information with each other, take part in discussions with each other, and have these engaging, uh, engaging discussions that uh, leave us wanting more. So in an effort to find the correlation between Stoic philosophy and Freemasonry, I'm very honored and, and privileged to be able to be here with you tonight to present to you Hieramic Meditations, How Freemasonry Crafts a Stoic Lifestyle. So I just wanna share with you all some of the topics that we're going to be discussing tonight. So I'm going to be introducing to you three important Stoics who are Zeno, Epictetus, and Marcus Aurelius. We're gonna discuss uh, the different areas of study that we can find in Stoic philosophy. We're gonna go a little bit into the correlation between Stoicism and Freemasonry, which involves the Masonic and Stoic virtues and the Ashlers and Stoicism. And then finally, we're going to end with the five Stoic concepts that are also found in Freemasonry, which are premeditatio malorum, which translates to the premeditation of evils. We're gonna look at self-control practice, amor fati, which is loving your fate, memento mori, which is the uh, Stoic concept that reminds us to remember our mortality, and then finally, we're going to see how journaling can come into play in both Stoicism and Freemasonry. And in the end, I'm going to have some concluding remarks, and we're going to leave some time open for any questions that you might have. So Zeno and Stoicism. 
So Zeno is the merchant in the story of Stoicism, and his story is told in a philosophical text called The Lives and Opinions of Eminent Philosophers by a philosopher called Diogenes Laertius. Zeno is considered the father of Stoicism, and his story starts um, as a 22-year-old wealthy merchant, and he became shipwrecked while on the way to Athens. And when he became shipwrecked in Athens, this event actually forced him to question his life, and he began to question what it is that he was placing value on. Um, whether he was placing value on it or not, he was forced to undergo this existential time and this moment in his life to try to figure out what it was that he wanted out of, out of life. And the story goes that he soon contacted an oracle and he asked the oracle what it is that he should do in order to attain the best life that he possibly could. And the oracle is said to have responded to him that by direct order of the gods, he needed to adopt what is called the complexion of the dead. So he took some time to think about this and he questioned what it is that it meant. And he came to the conclusion that what he needed to do was study philosophy. He needed to become a man of philosophy and he needed to immerse himself in the world of philosophy. So he was frequenting a bookshop and he started to read different texts from different philosophers and he fell in love with the philosopher known as Socrates. Um, and it got to a point where he said, I need to study philosophy under individuals like Socrates. Um, so he walked up to the bookseller and he asked the bookseller, hey, where is it that I can find individuals that are like this? And then right at that moment, there was a philosopher that was passing outside of the bookshop who's known as a Cato of Thebes. And he was a very prominent cynic philosopher at the time. So the bookseller pointed at him and said, hey, this is the individual that you need to study under. And when Zeno saw that he was walking outside, he ran after him. He ran after him and he said, hey, listen, I want to be your student. I want to study philosophy under you. And Cato took him under his wing. And Zeno became a student. He studied from an, a wide array of different philosophers. And it got to a point where he felt comfortable enough to be able to teach philosophy to students. And the philosophy that he developed, that he started teaching his students, was originally called Zenoism. But today, we know it as Stoicism. And, and the reason why it's called Stoicism is because he was teaching his students in a public colonnade, right? And the public colonnade was called the Stoa Poikili. So as time developed, uh, the name Zenoism, I guess, didn't stick. And then these students ended up being called the Stoics, right? And it ended up being a school of thought that deals with combating negative emotions and self-development. Now, something interesting that I found uh, while I was doing research for this is that in contemporary times, we now think of someone, when someone is a Stoic, we think that maybe they're not showing emotions or they might lack empathy, when really this isn't the case. They're just controlling their emotions and they're not letting themselves be governed by their emotions. Now, at the time, the original Stoics were the poets and the musicians which is funny because we know of poets and musicians uh, as individuals that share their emotions. Um, but over time, they lost the name and the name transferred to the Stoics that we know today. So the next philosopher that we're going to talk about is a philosopher called Epictetus. And Epictetus was a slave. So in 50 AD, Epictetus was born into slavery in Heropolis, Phrygia, which is known as present-day Turkey. Now, there are um, sort of mixed accounts as to how he became a slave. Some historians say that he was sold into slavery. Others, other historians say that he was born into it. But the great majority of historians agree that he was born into slavery. And when he was born into slavery, he, he, he became a slave under this man called Epaphroditus. Um, and it was uh, at, at a later age 
as, uh, as Epictetus was growing up, he also came to the same conclusion that Zeno came to. And he said, I want to become a student of philosophy and I want to immerse myself in the world of philosophy. And he asked Epaphroditus if he could actually become uh, a, a, philosoph a student of philosophy. Um, and Epaphroditus was a wealthy freedman and he was also the, the secretary to Nero at the time. And Epaphroditus granted him his wish and said that you can become a student of philosophy. And he studied under a philosopher of the name uh, Musonius Rufus, who's a, who was an important philosopher at the time, especially when it came to uh, Stoic philosophy. And it was after Nero's death in 68 AD uh, that Epictetus was freed, was freed from being a, a slave. And then he also began to teach his own form of Stoicism. Now, when it comes to Zeno, Zeno did not leave any works behind. However, historians do argue that he wrote a text called Zeno's Republic, which kind of mirrors Plato's Republic. However, Zeno's book sees and envisions a world that would be governed by Stoic philosophy. And he imagines what it would be like in order to live in a world where everybody was a Stoic. Now, when it comes to Epictetus, Epictetus never actually wrote any works, but we do have two of his works today because of one of his students. And it, one, of, one of his students uh, was called Arian. And Arian believed that Epictetus was just as important as Socrates. And he felt that what he needed to do was he needed to write every single word that Epictetus was saying. So he felt that he needed to write it down. And that's why today we have two different works from Epictetus. So we have the discourses of Epictetus, and then we also have another uh, important Stoic text that's called Epictetus's Enchiridion, or the Enchiridion of Epictetus. And Enchiridion just um, translates to the Handbook of Epictetus. And what that handbook is, is just 52 different uh, aphorisms or sayings that um, Epictetus always reminded his students uh, to keep in mind. Um, and it's in the very first aphorism of this work that Epictetus teaches readers and his students that there are some things in your control and there are other things that are not in, in your control. Now Epictetus, although he was a slave at the time, was very much an influence on our next figure, um, whose work is going to, whose work has a, a lot of correlation when it comes to Freemasonry. So Marcus Aurelius, who was the emperor of Rome, the last of the five great emperors of Rome. He was born Marcus Aurelius Antoninus Augustus in Rome in 121 AD. And then shortly after he was born, his father actually died and he was adopted by his grandfather in 124 AD. Now, as he was growing up, his life um, was very troubled in the sense that he is a child of um, great loss when it comes to his parents. And the way that he ended up becoming emperor was because of a series of adoptions. So I just uh, wrote some of them down here, the, the, the important ones, because I, I wanted to put some perspective as to how he ended up becoming the emperor of Rome at the time. So it was uh, at 17 years old that the emperor at the time, Hadrian, grew fond of Marcus Aurelius, and he called him Verissimus, which translates to the most true and faithful. It was after his grandfather's death that a man called Titus Aurelius Antoninus adopted Marcus Aurelius. Hadrian himself had adopted Titus, the man that had adopted Marcus Aurelius. And when Hadrian passed away in 138 AD, Titus took over as emperor. Titus passed away in 161 AD, and then Marcus Aurelius became emperor. And he's considered one of, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, emperor of Rome. And um, he wrote the meditations from 161 AD to 180 AD during his term as emperor of Rome. Um, and in book one, entry seven, Marcus Aurelius actually thanks his tutor, Junius Rusticus, uh, for having, quote, encountered the, encountered the discourses of Epictetus, to which he introduced me with his own copy. 
So here we have a student of philosophy um, and an individual that arrived to the same conclusion that Zeno and Epictetus arrived and said, I need to be a student of philosophy. I want to study philosophy and I want to immerse myself in that world. And his tutor, his private tutor, Junius Rusticus, actually gave him a copy of Epictetus's discourses that Arian had written. So here we have an emperor that is greatly influenced um, by the teachings of Epictetus the slave. And um, Marcus Aurelius ended up writing what we now know today as the Meditations. However, he never really intended on this becoming a published work. These were just his private journals where he discussed his mortality, where he discussed what it meant to be a good human being. Um, he discussed what it is that we place value on. Um, and then at, it was after his death that it was found, it was published, and it, it's lasted, and it's considered now arguably the greatest text on, on, on Stoic philosophy. So what is Stoicism? So Stoicism is a Hellenistic school of thought that involves itself in three different areas of study. However, in contemporary times, we do know that Stoicism has mostly focused on the ethical side of things. However, I, I still wanted to present the three different studies because I think that they're very interesting and, and very important to what it is that we'll be discussing today in relation to Freemasonry. So Stoicism teaches logic. And the Stoics argue that knowledge is attained through the use of reason and that it's the only way that we can gain true comp comprehension and conviction in our lives. When it comes to physics, the Stoics argue that the universe is, actually, is God and that it's divided into two different classes, what's known as the active and the passive. Now, passive substance is known as matter, so anything that's material. And active substance is known as fate, or anything that is for example, as Seneca writes in his letters, anything that fortune has brought upon you, which might cons uh, be considered your destiny as well. And then finally, we know that Stoicism teaches ethics. And it's through the ethical arguments that we understand that one must discipline his perception, his action, and his will. Now, I think that when it comes to Freemasonry and Stoicism, I think that the, the cosmological argument that Stoicism makes is very fascinating. So I wanted to share it with you all here tonight. So Stoicism is considered a practical school of thought because it is presented as a way of life instead of simply a theoretical thought. The goal in, with Stoicism is to attain happiness by understanding that destructive emotions are the result of making errors in judgment. In order to live a life of happiness, one that is free from suffering, destructive emotions, and the negative effects that come from them, Stoics embrace the journey to become what's known as a sage, which is the individual that has both moral and intellectual perfection. For the Stoic, there is a relationship between cosmic determinism and human freedom. So they believe in a form of soft determinism. All individuals are seen as being manifestations of one universal spirit. And we are taught that we need to live in brotherly love, that we need to be ever ready to help one another. The cosmos is viewed as one expansive organism that is working within itself, which exhibits a complex harmonious structure that is generated from a single divine principle that extends throughout all aspects of the universe which also includes our minds. And this, pr this principle is called universal reason. It's also known as the mind. Some Stoics refer to it as God, and Marcus Aurelius called it Zeus. It's not a supernatural entity or a transcendent being, but it embodies every fabric of the universe, meaning that everything is connected in, in, in the eyes of the Stoic. So, in order to attain and live a life of happiness, one has to subdue their passions, combat negative thoughts and emotions, and we also need to cultivate virtues. So what exactly is the correlation between Stoicism and Freemasonry? Now, while I was reading last week, 
this new translation of the Bhagavad Gita. Not sure if any brother has uh, read it, but it's a very important Hindu scripture. Um, there was a section in the afterword on Henry David Thoreau, who is pictured here and who was a transcendentalist writer. So he was not a Freemason. Um, and a lot of Stoics would argue that his life was governed by, by a lot of Stoic philosophy, but he never really expressed himself to be a Stoic. And it was after reading the Bhagavad Gita that he wrote in his private journals that he understood that every man is the builder of a temple called his body to the God that he worships after a style purely his own, nor can he get off by hammering marble instead. Henry David Thoreau says that we are all sculptors and painters and our material is our own flesh and blood and bones. He says that any nobleness begins at once to refine a man's features and any meanness or sensuality to imbrue him. And I thought that this was fascinating because I think that this quote and really these lessons are the same lessons that Stoic philosophy teaches Stoics and that Freemasonry teaches Masons, right? Because through understanding the Hiramic legend, um, we understand that we as Masons are sort of building our spiritual inner temple. Well, similarly, the Stoics and Marcus Aurelius also mention an inner spiritual temple. However, they don't call it an, uh, a spiritual temple. They call it the inner citadel instead. And one of the important things that was mentioned before in order to be able to build your inner citadel or the spiritual temple is or are the four virtues, right? So it's in book four of the Republic that Plato gives us the cardinal virtues, which he specifies are four in number. And similarly, Freemasons are introduced to the same cardinal virtues in the entered apprentice degree. So we know that the four Masonic cardinal virtues are fortitude, prudence, temperance, and justice. Now, in the same notion, the four Stoic virtues are wisdom, justice, courage, and moderation. So we know that fortitude is the noble purpose of the mind that allows us to overcome any obstacles that we may come uh, to face. Prudence, we know, is regulation of our lives in accordance to reason. Temperance is the restraint that we develop to not allow ourselves to become governed by our vices. And then with justice, we understand that it's the ability to give every person their just due without making any distinction. Now, these virtues are very much important to the story that's told in the rough ashlar and the perfect ashlar. So we have the rough ashlar, the perfect ashlar, and we have the, uh, the tracing board, right, which are the three movable jewels. Now, in Stoicism, we're taught that in order to become morally and intellectually perfect, the Stoic needs to do three things. So the Stoic needs to cultivate virtues, the Stoic needs to discipline himself, and the Stoic also needs to live in harmony with nature. And I found it very interesting that in Freemasonry, in the Entered Apprentice lecture, we're also taught that the process whereby the rough ashlar becomes a perfect ashlar is done through three, three steps, right? And the three steps are through a virtuous education, through the Mason's own effort, and the blessing of God. So since Stoics argue that happiness is acquired by attaining virtue, which for them is excellence of character, Freemasons are also taught that in order to attain this same excellence of character, we need to follow these five maxims and exercises that are also intimately expressed in the Blue Lodge degrees. So the first of the five Stoic concepts that we're going to discuss is um, the Stoic concept of premeditatio malorum, which uh, translates to the premeditations of evils. And I make a connection with the Hiramic legend and seeing the Hiramic legend as a cautionary tale. So it's in book two, entry one, that Marcus Aurelius writes, say to yourself first thing in the morning, 
Today, I shall meet people who are meddling, ungrateful, aggressive, treacherous, malicious, unsocial. And he writes that all this has afflicted them through their ignorance of true good and evil. I make a connection to the Hiramic legend as a cautionary tale because we know that the Hiramic legend is a story um, where a brotherhood is broken in a way, right? We know that the Mason experiences a tale of uh, betrayal from those that are closest to him, right? And with this depiction, the Mason is taught that we are all liable to a moral and ethical lapse of judgment. And this lapse of being ungrateful, aggressive, treacherous, malicious can actually lead us figuratively, right? To experience the death of those closest to us, especially our brothers. However, in living a virtuous life and perfecting the inner temple or inner citadel, we avoid having this lapse of judgment. And what I mean by this is that the Stoics were arguing that every morning when you wake up, you should wake up and think about all of the bad things that can happen to you throughout the day. Um, but it's not, it's not for, for it to be something pessimistic. It's not for it to be a pessimistic exercise or for it to be morbid in a way, right? But this exercise of the premeditations of, of evils is more so in order to teach you that you have to be ready for anything that can happen. Right, So it's in order to properly equip you to be able to go through any obstacle that might present its way to you. Now, one thing that um, the connection that I was making is that we need to understand that the Hiramic legend also extends outside of the lodge as well, right? So this same betrayal that the brothers, that each one of us um, experienced in the lodge figuratively we also need to know that this is the same betrayal that can come outside of the lodge, literally. And what I mean by that is, you know, all of us have been most likely on social media in the past couple of months. We've seen that conversations regarding politics and other issues might come up, right? And we see how brothers are uh, referring to each other, right? And it's in a way that might mimic the same um, contentious atmosphere of the Hiramic legend. So one thing is that, um, that I find very important that Marcus Aurelius writes in book 10, entry 30, he actually warns that whenever you take offense at the wrong done by another, move on to consider what similar wrong you yourself are committing. So the next concept that we're going to discuss is the concept of self-control practice. And uh, within the craft, the concept of uh, squaring our actions. So it's in book six, entry 30, that Marcus Aurelius writes, take care not to be Caesarified or dyed in purple. He reminds that it happens. He tells us, or he warns us to keep yourself simple, good, pure, serious, unpretentious. Remain a friend of justice, God-fearing, kind, full of affection, strong for your proper work. Strive hard to remain the same man that philosophy wished to make you. He reminds us to revere the gods, look after men, because life is short. And he also warns that the one harvest of existence on earth is a godly habit of mind and social action. Now, when Stoics argue about what self-control practice actually encompasses, what they're arguing is that we shouldn't be acting impulsively. We should avoid any behaviors that might develop into addictive behaviors. We shouldn't overindulge in any pleasures. And we should also detach ourselves from luxuries. Now, in having this understanding, it made me think of the square that's introduced to the, bro the, the brother or the mason in the fellow craft degree. Now, the square also happens to be the jewel of the worshipful master in the lodge. And I think that it's very important as a worshipful master to remind yourself to practice self-control because a lot of times when you do end up in a position of power like that, um, it's very easy to allow it to let it get to your head, right? And this is why Marcus Aurelius, again, the last of the five great emperors of Rome, is writing to himself 
in his journals that he shouldn't allow himself to be Caesarified or dyed in purple. And what he means by dyed in purple, and he, he makes, um, he elaborates on this in another journal entry, right? As an emperor of Rome, what he was wearing was a purple robe, right? Because purple is a, is a color that is regal and it's a color that denotes royalty. Um, and it's in book six, entry 13, that Marcus Aurelius writes to himself, your purple edged robe is simply the hair of a sheep soaked in shellfish blood. So he's reminding himself that yes, he is the emperor of Rome, but at the end of the day, the color purple doesn't really denote anything right? It's his own actions and the way that, and his character that really make him who he is. It's not so much the, uh, the title that has been uh, placed upon him. So a lot of times, you know, I'll mention um, as a worshipful master, yes, I do get to have a W next to my name and perhaps brothers do get to refer to me as worshipful. Um, but I think it's very important to remember that within the lodge, at least for me, there is no higher title uh, than brother. So the next concept that we're going to be discussing is the concept of amor fati, which is um, love your fate, and its relation to the tessellated floor within the lodge room. So it's in book five, entry eight, that Marcus Aurelius writes, what happens to each individual is arranged to his destiny. We speak of the fitness of these happenings as masons speak of the fit of squared stones in walls or pyramids when they join each other in a defined relation. What Marcus Aurelius is arguing with, with, the, with this writing is that whether something, whether a situation is good or bad, they're both going to be instrumental to your development in character. Um, if it's good, you might uh, be delighted at whatever it is that happened. And if it's bad, it might be easy uh, for us to just uh, maybe wallow in misery or uh, feel bad about ourselves. But at the same time, we also need to find what it is that that, that bad event or that bad situation um, or ba that bad um, communication with, with another individual, what is it that that event taught us, right? And I make the connection to the tessellated floor because we know that the tessellated floor is a very important moment in the development of the Freemason, right? It's a moment of character transformation, and it's a moment, uh, it, it, it's Im important in a moment where the Freemason accepts, makes, makes uh, an acceptance uh, in order to become a better individual and seek this enlightenment, right? Um, but this can only be done on a tessellated floor that has both white and black, right? And we know that there are def uh, different uh, esoteric interpretations to the duality of the color white and black, you know, in, in its most, uh, I guess in, in the simplest terms, you know, white is good and, and the black is, uh, is the bad and the evil. But we do know that we cannot have the understanding of one without the understanding of the other. Right, and I think that uh, not only are, is the tessellated floor, the understanding of the teaching of the tessellated floor, important for the Freemason, um, but I also want to give you an example of how having the understanding of bad events also helped out the development of the Stoic philosophy. Right, so it was actually at the end of his life. Um, that Zeno, after initially being shipwrecked, as we mentioned before, Zeno is actually quoted as saying, I now find that I made a prosperous voyage when I was wrecked. So it was in fact him being shipwrecked that actually guided him in the right direction that he needed to go to in order to become a better individual. So the next concept that we're going to be discussing is the chamber of reflection, right? So the, the Stoic concept is memento mori, which is remember your mortality, and the chamber of reflection. Although the chamber of reflection is mostly used in the Scottish Rite, 
I make mention of the Chamber of Reflection because the there are two um, important items in the Chamber of Reflection that are introduced in the three craft uh, in the Blue Lodge degrees. So it's in book two, entry 11, that Marcus Aurelius writes, you may leave this life at any moment. Have this possibility in your mind and all that you do or say or think. The correlation that I make from this writing, this text to my life is a lot of times there will be people that ask me, for example, what my age is. And if I tell them that I'm 26, they'll tell me something like, well, you know, you have your whole entire life ahead of you to do whatever it is that you want to do. And the truth is that while this, th this is only wishful thinking, you know, I, I in fact have no idea how much time I have uh, on this earth in order to do what it is that I want to do. And the Stoics are actively keeping their mortality in their conscience conscious you know they 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 are actively thinking about it and not because again they want to be pessimistic or because they want to be morbid it's because they're asking themselves if i were to die right now am i okay with leaving the the, the world behind as it is am i okay with the things that i've done am i okay with the things that i haven't done if i'm not then how can i change my life Right, and I think that the uh, the chamber of reflection also allows the Freemasonry right during during the the initiation to meditate on his mortality in a similar fashion, right? And then the the two the two items which are known as the monitorial emblems that are found in the chamber of reflection that we're also introduced to in the Blue Lodge degrees are the hourglass and the Sith. So we know that the hourglass represents life and how quickly we pass through it. And the Sith represents time and how everything is consumed by time, no matter the status. So again, going back, it doesn't matter if you are uh, an entered apprentice, a fellow craft, or master mason, a worshipful master. You know, there, there's a great saying. Um, I don't know who, where it comes from, so I, I don't have anyone to attribute it to. But it's a, it's, it's a saying that I've heard time and time again, where at the end of a game of chess, the king and the pawn go in the same box, right? Um, and I think that the Chamber of Reflection and Freemasonry as a whole calls for the Freemason to think about his mortality and what is, not only what comes next, but what is it that you are currently doing in your life? Um, how is it that you can improve yourself and how is it that you can improve your immediate community around you, right? And it's in book six, entry 24, that Marcus Aurelius sort of elaborates on how death impacts the world. So he said that Alexander the Great and his muleteer were both leveled in death. So either they were taken up into the same generative principles of the universe or they were equally dispersed into atoms. So in short, what he's saying is that um, Alexander the Great and um, his horse, they're both going to experience the same death and either they're going to go back and be one with God or they're just going to disappear for the rest of eternity, right? And I think that as Freemasons, we should constantly ask ourselves um, and question our mortality um, and try to focus on, on what it is that that questioning can actually allow us to do in our own, not only for our own lives, but for our lodges and for our communities as well. So next, this, this is actually my, uh, my favorite, I would say, part of the, the presentation aside from the, the Q&A. Um, and I know that a lot of other brothers have equally enjoyed it as well. Um, because I'm going to talk about journaling, so the act of journaling, and then the tracing board. So we discussed the rough ashlar and the perfect ashlar, and we understand that the rough ashlar shows the initiate in his root and imperfect state. And the perfect ashlar can only become perfect, right, uh, after the fellow crafts have followed the instructions, the drawings, and the designs that have been left for them 
on the tracing board in order to turn the rough ashlar into a perfect ashlar. Now, when it comes to the tracing board, I think that the act of journaling that the Stoics expressed is very much important. And what I mean by that is that a lot of Freemasons historically have left behind their journals. So brother Mark Twain was not only a writer, uh, but he also actively journaled. Um, a Oscar Wilde was another brother that actively journaled. Um, and brother Winston Churchill is an individual that also journaled as well. Now in making this correlation, what I argue is that in the world that we live in today, we're conditioned to meeting everyone else, but nobody ever teaches us how to meet ourselves. And what I mean by that is if I want to get a good job, right, I need to go to a workshop where they're going to show me how to answer questions, what it is that I need to put on my resume in order to get uh, an employer's attention, right? If I want to get uh, a significant other, then there are certain um, maybe uh, ways that I need to approach the significant other in order to get to know her so that we can uh, become a couple. But nobody ever teaches us how to communicate with ourselves. And I think that that um, is a disservice to ourselves as human beings because we never really get to have conversations with ourselves to better understand ourselves. And I think that on some level, maybe that's an issue that uh, many individuals have been dealing with during this pandemic because now we've been forced to be behind uh, or, or inside four walls, right? So journaling, much like Marcus Aurelius used to address himself, I believe is a call to adventure for the Mason to actually engage in a dialogue with himself. Now, Brother Winston Churchill was an individual that actively journaled. And in one of his journal entries, he wrote that, every night I try myself by court martial to see if I have done anything effective during the day. I don't mean just pawing the ground. Anyone can go through the motions, but something really effective. So Brother Winston Churchill was writing in his journal, not just to pass the time away, he was writing because he wanted to sort of figure out, am I doing what I feel I should be doing? Am I wasting time? Am I making good use of this time, right? Now, there's another individual that used journaling as well. So if I'm not mistaken, when he was 17 years old, Brother Benjamin Franklin uh, was an individual that wanted to cultivate virtues. And he assigned himself with the task of cultivating what he felt were the 13 most important virtues that any individual should cultivate. So he developed this plan to be able to cultivate these virtues. And these are the 13 virtues that he wanted to um, cultivate and, and accomplish in integrating into his life because he wanted to become a morally and intellectually perfect individual. So the first one is temperance. And he wrote to himself that one shouldn't eat to dullness or drink to elevation. Silence, speak not but what may benefit others or yourself and avoid trifling conversations. He said that an individual should have order. Let all your things have their places. Let each part of your business have its time. Resolution. Resolve to perform what you ought. Perform without fail what you resolve. Frugality. Make no expense but to do good to others or yourself. He reminds that you shouldn't waste anything. Industry. Lose no time. Make use of it. Be always employed in something useful and cut off all unnecessary actions in your life. Sincerity, use no hurtful deceit. Think innocently and justly. And if you're going to speak, speak accordingly. Justice, wrong none by doing injuries or omitting the benefits that are your duties. Moderation, one must avoid extremes. Forbear resenting injuries so much as you think they deserve. One should practice cleanliness. Tolerate no uncleanliness in your body, clothes, or habitation. Tranquility. Be not disturbed at trifles or at accidents that are common 
or sometimes unavoidable. One should practice chastity. Rarely use venery but for health or offspring, never to dullness, weakness, or the injury of your own or another's peace or reputation. And finally, just like Zeno did long ago, Brother Benjamin Franklin warns that one should always practice humility, that we should imitate both Jesus and Socrates. And in his plan, this is actually a part, a page of virtues, as he called it, uh, from his journals. So what he would do was um, he would write the days of the week, as you can see, and then he would write the 13 different virtues. And he knew that he wasn't going to be able to cultivate all of the virtues at the same time. So what he was doing was he was trying to see if he could uh, cultivate one by one. And then once he felt that he had mastered one of the virtues, he would move on to the next one. And then here you can see that in one week, these were the, the virtues that he felt that he had cultivated throughout the day. Now, one, I would say heartwarming thing, right? And the reason why I'm making this connection to the tracing board is because Brother Benjamin Franklin includes all of this in his autobiography. And the reason why he wrote his, this autobiography is because he wanted to develop a manual that he could leave behind to his son. And when his son would read the, the autobiography, he wanted it to be the instructions of how to become a morally and intellectually uh, perfect individual. So it was almost as if he was seeing his son as the initiate of life and he was giving him this autobiography and saying, follow these instructions and you're going to be just fine because you're going to hopefully develop into the morally and intellectually perfect individual um, that both Freemasonry and Stoicism, right, are actively engaged in, in teaching the initiate. So I ask you all here, how far are you from attaining moral and intellectual perfection, right? In our mentor's manual, supplied by the Grand Lodge of Florida, a distinction is made between the Master Mason degree and the degrees of Entered Apprentice and Fellowcraft. We're taught that in the first two degrees, architecture was the theme of our symbolism. And in the degree of Master Mason, our symbols are of a different character. They speak of life, its tragedy, and of its ultimate triumph if we're able to attain virtue. So I ask you, if the builders can only erect a lodge by using perfect ashlars, how strong are our individual ashlars for both our lodges and our communities? Thank you. Wow, Washpool, sure. that is an amazing uh, presentation. Uh, I would like to, to finish uh, taking out your words, uh, from Marcus Aurelius. I would like to say that your, your presentation will finish saying what we do, the call is in eternity. Do you brother remember that? expression that quote what we do now calls in the eternity thank you very much worshipful daniel i will ask brother javier to open up all the microphones and uh,